Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to our lecture series DNA and Design. The subtitle of these um, few lectures uh, is The Information Enigma, and this is an especially fascinating area of DNA science and origin of life science, and again, I believe very strongly bolsters the case that DNA arose through intelligent design. Okay, with that introduction, let's now turn to DNA and flesh out this notion of the information enigma. Remember how DNA works. It is basically a digital code. The order of the DNA bases when DNA is transcribed into RNA determines the order of RNA bases and the four-letter alphabet of DNA is turned into three-letter words or three-letter codons of RNA and they determine the order of amino acids to make a protein. And we've already seen how important it is to have the right order of amino acids so we can make a functional protein. That means that DNA is embedded with information. It carries the information that ultimately gets transcribed and then translated into the correct amino acid ordering to make the proteins that the body needs. And the question is, where did this information come from? How did the DNA code, which we have already discussed, is essentially universal and is essentially as old as life itself? How was the DNA, quote unquote, born with this information? Where did the information come from? That is the information enigma that we will explore in these uh, lectures. So the standard answer to the question really takes us directly into theories about the origin of life itself. How did life originate? Because that is almost an equivalent question to asking how did the information necessary for life originate? And the standard answer, I would say, begins with a very famous experiment in biology and in origin of life research known as the Miller-Urey experiment. Uh, that experiment is named after the two experimenters, Stanley Miller and Harold Urey, working out of the University of Chicago in 1952. And what Miller did was he set up what he thought were conditions resembling the early Earth atmosphere, primitive Earth, water, methane, ammonia, hydrogen, heated them and put in an electrical spark to uh, simulate, for example, lightning discharges or um, energy from lava flows, etc., and wanted to see what could be produced from these very basic chemicals that were thought to be the primitive Earth atmosphere. If God wills and we have time to talk about origin of life, we will see that those assumptions are questionable, but in any case, this is the experiment that ended up getting published in all of the high school and college biology textbooks. Because what Miller and Urey found was that when you did this, you could spontaneously produce biological products. You could produce the building blocks of life, amino acids, some nucleic acids, and so forth. And so here was a ready explanation of how the primitive chemicals that were thought to make up Earth's primitive atmosphere 
or I should say the basic chemicals that were thought to make up Earth's primitive atmosphere, could under natural conditions synthesize the building blocks of life like amino acids. Now, from there, let's say I now have this primitive ocean filled with these basic building blocks like amino acids. How did first life form? And the answer to that question is really a reflection of Darwinian thinking by chance that a bunch of amino acids sort of got together, made peptide bonds, bonded together, and made the first functional proteins and somehow linked to a similar process going on with DNA. So the expression of this chance hypothesis um, was taught to so many of us in high school and college. Uh, I've just pulled out a quote from a biochemistry book that I used in college, Leninger's biochemistry book. And uh, so he says, quote, we now come to the critical moment in evolution in which the first semblance of life appeared through the chance association of a number of abiotically formed macromolecular components. And so there is the chance hypothesis that in the primitive oceans of Earth, through a process like that shown in the experiments of Miller and Urey, uh, basic amino acids, basic nucleotides, etc., were formed through natural processes like uh, lightning discharges through the Earth's primitive atmosphere. And by chance, these got together and formed functional proteins. So that is the chance hypothesis. Now, the link between proteins and DNA, of course, is a very difficult issue. Um, and we will explore that in a later uh, lecture, God willing, but for now, let's just focus on proteins since they are the end product of DNA. The uh, opposing point of view is uh, well expressed by uh, Fred Hoyle. Uh, so who was Fred Hoyle? He was professor of astronomy and experimental philosophy at Cambridge University and uh, founded the Cambridge Institute of Theoretical Astronomy. A uh, very highly decorated scientist, a fellow of the Royal Society in England, uh, an honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, an associate member of the American National Academy of Sciences, um, which is the highest honor that the United States can bestow on a non-American scientist, uh, and so forth. And he was knighted by the Queen in 1972. Um, uh, in recognition of his contributions to theoretical physics and cosmology. Uh, I just wanted to lay out his background in a little bit of detail uh, so that his opinion is not uh, you know, dismissed as, oh, he just another creationist and so on. And in fact, he is not a creationist at all. Um, so what he says regarding chance, uh, he says, quote, despite this, and that this here is a previous argument he was saying that chance is untenable. The entire structure of orthodox biology still holds that life arose at random. Yet, as biologists learn more and more about the awesome complexity of life, it is apparent that the chances of it originating by accident are so minute that they can be completely ruled out. Life cannot have arisen by chance. In the following chapter, uh, talking about an issue in evolution, he now tackles the notion that we are getting at that quote at some stage the genesis of information must be explained this as we saw in the previous chapter is essentially impossible within the biological system itself only if the genetic information comes from outside the system from somewhere else altogether can evolution per saltum be explained and so this is the opinion that the information enigma um, it makes it incumbent to rule out uh, the chance hypothesis. So how do we decide then between the two hypotheses? Chance giving rise to the information that is in DNA or 
that this information could not have arisen by chance. One very useful approach is to try to quantitate the information and to really ask, OK, one reflection of how much information there is and in essence whether it could have arisen by chance is to try to mathematically estimate the likelihood that this information could have arisen by chance. And to do that, we will use the case of a simple protein measuring roughly 150 amino acids in length. Um, I'll tell you why I picked that figure uh, shortly, but that is a small protein. The body makes many, many larger and more complex proteins. So if we use this, we are doing a very conservative estimate, an estimate that helps the chance hypothesis. And so if we can show that it would be very unlikely for even one protein out of the thousands of proteins which the body uses, many of which are much longer than 150 amino acids, um, if we can show that one such small protein is very unlikely to have arisen by chance, then certainly all of the information contained in DNA for all of the proteins used in our body would be extremely unlikely to have arisen by chance. But to be able to meaningfully answer that question, we will need to learn a couple of more things about proteins first, and then we will delve into um, some quantitative explorations.